Yeah. Um, how does Van Til's concept of paradox differ from Kierkegaard's theory? I hope to talk about Van Til before the classes, before the semester is over. <coughs> but let me say this. My impression is, I could mention some differences between the two, but my impression is that in spite of the fact that Van Til denies he is a neo-orthodox apology, I think he has been very deeply influenced by neo-orthodoxy and unwittingly supports their position. But let that do for the present, and I'll try to explain it further <coughs> when we get to uh, some time now. Later on, maybe after the break, if there's some parts of this you want to ask questions about as to what they mean and so on for the explanation, I'll be glad to do it. But uh, I say I want to get over a few pages to make sure that uh, the important parts are not missed. At any rate, he defends the necessity of uh, having an intellectual understanding because you can't believe absurdities unless you know what absurdities are. And hence, you must be able to show that the Christian doctrines contradict each other. Now, when you, when you understand that the doctrines of Christianity contradict each other and can't possibly be true, then you must believe them. And that's faith. And uh, unless you deliberately believe absurdities, you have no faith. This is a point to be noticed. Orthodox or traditional theologians have often said that the truths of revelation are not against reason, but above reason. For Kierkegaard, the above has no particular meaning, and faith is strictly against reason. This is why understanding and reason are essential. Every man can qualitatively distinguish between what he understands and what he does not understand. When he stakes his life on the absurd, he makes the motion in virtue of the absurd, and he is essentially deceived in case the absurd he has chosen cannot be, can be proved to be not the absurd. To act in ignorance is not, against, is not to act against reason. Acting against reason requires a clear-cut understanding that two propositions are contradictory and a voluntary belief in both. So a Christian may very well have understanding. Indeed, he must have it in order to believe against understanding. Kierkegaard mentions many examples of absurd Christian doctrines. His chief examples, perhaps in a sense all his examples, depend on the impossibility of a mixture of time and eternity. God is eternal. Therefore, it is logically impossible for God to appear or act in time. Though one might not think of it at first, not only the incarnation, but forgiveness of sin also is impossible for the same reason. Forgiveness involves a relationship between eternal truth and an existing individual. It purports to be an eternal decision in time with retroactive power to annul the past. If, however... Forgiveness is not a paradox, it cannot be believed, and the believer must believe it. The individual existing human being must feel himself a sinner with all the strength of his mind. He must try to understand the forgiveness of sins. Thus, the simple man will doubtless say, the more vividly I believe it, the less am I able to understand it. Uh, this line of procedure might seem to help the critic to understand what Kierkegaard meant by faith. To ordinary people, faith <coughs> is belief that something is so, like vinegar cures 
warts. Now the critic discovers <coughs> that Kierkegaard's faith begins by understanding that two propositions, for example, God is eternal and God became man, are contradictories. They cannot in any way be harmonized. Now you asked about Van Til. When I come to this lecture, I'm going to use frame for a certain purpose. <coughs> and uh, he says something like this. The, uh, <coughs> he, he insists that uh, every proposition in the Bible is self-contradictory. Yeah, I will come to that. <coughs> they cannot in any way be harmonized. Faith now has an object, two objects. It believes both contradictories. The Christian believes that God became man, and he believes with equal further that, good, that God could not possibly have become man. Rather obviously, Kierkegaard is not the spokesman for Christianity. Who in the whole history of the church ever believed these two contradictories? Where in the Bible are they asserted? One may, from an atheistic standpoint, condemn Christians for being stupid enough to believe in God, or from a mildly religious standpoint, one may call them superstitious for believing the impossible. But who with a straight face can characterize the Christian movement as a belief in contradictories? Christians believe God became incarnate. They emphatically do not believe that he could not become incarnate. What Kierkegaard means by faith <coughs> is totally at variance with the Christian meaning of faith. <coughs> the reason Christians do not believe in do not believe contradictories is that no one can. A non Christian critic of Kierkegaard will soon discover that he, the critic, is rational and not insane. And unless one is insane, it is impossible by any act of will to believe both of two contradictories, knowing them to be contradictories. True enough, one may hold opposing propositions without knowing it, but when another points out the inconsistency, the victim will try to harmonize the two and argue that they do not conflict, or he will cease to believe one or both. Yet Kierkegaard supposes, supposes it possible to understand clearly that vinegar cures warts, and vinegar does not cure warts, are two contradictories, and with this clear understanding, decide to believe both. This matter of the repudiation of the laws of logic calls for a little additional emphasis. Although Kierkegaard has a flair for literary style, waxes rhetorical at times, and pillories his opponents with sarcasm, satire, and scorn, his frequent references to contradictories must be taken at literal face value. To make it clear that the absurd is not just something queer and unfamiliar to popular opinion, he very soberly and earnestly defines it as contradictory. Quote, Insofar as the absurd comprehends within itself the factor of becoming, one way of approximation will be that which confuses the absurd fact of such a becoming, which is the object of faith, with a simple historical fact, and hence seeks historical certainty for that which is absurd because it involves the contradiction that something which can become historical only in direct opposition to all human reason has become historical. It is this contradiction which constitutes the absurd and which can only be believed. 